Um, my name is Patrick Benz. Um, I am a member of the uh, MER, uh, NMRA, and I am also the caretaker at Northlands, which is the Great American Railway. Uh, I have been the caretaker there for about seven months now. Um, basically what it means is I'm in charge of keeping trains running, in charge of keeping railroad running, um, keeping it open, um, and helping our guests um, enjoy their experience to the best of my abilities. So uh, I'm sure that some of you have been there. I've heard that, you know, a few of you have been to Northlands before. Um, in this case, this is a little more in-depth tour that I put together on a PowerPoint presentation uh, from the perspectives of, of someone who works there. Um, and we'll talk about some of the, 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 the secrets we have, a few we have, because we tend to uh, talk to our guests and show them what we do uh, when we're keeping trains running. So, When you come into Northlands, after you buy your ticket um, and head off to the right, um, the first area you see is the little town we call Cliffs. Um, it's also called 2% because this scene represents approximately 2% of the entire attraction. Um, when I started this, the scene was rather bare and plain. Um, it still is. Um, I added a whole lot of structures that were donated to us um, just to fill it in and make it look, look a little more realistic. Um, a lot of the track you see on the base level was put in by a local model railroad club that worked with Bruce Williams, the gentleman who built Northlands, um, probably 15, 20 years ago. Um, and they would operate, you know, the, the railroad. Um, I, I don't know if they did when it was, well, it was always pretty much always open. So they did it when people were there. Um, and they would hold their operating sessions. When Bruce sold the museum, they pulled out and the track has um, laid dormant since then. Um, we're trying to reconnect it with the DCC system. Um, I am moving slowly to make sure that I don't blow things up. Um, but we're hoping to be able to uh, have this the place where people can actually operate a train through a scene. Um, uh, it's using a, an NCE pro cap. So. The next scene around the corner is a little town we've called Vogelsberg. Um, it's named after one of my predecessors. Um, even these pictures are somewhat dated because I know that we've added at least one uh, uh, push button attraction in, in this scene uh, for people we can give kids something to do, push a button and something happens. Um, this is uh, just a place where the trains um, that run through uh, Northlands, the 80 or so trains, um, two of them come through this scene um, where people can see them and then uh, back in the canyon, which these pictures don't show, uh, you know, more trains uh, run through the deeper canyon behind this. The third scene um, is called Delbert's Cove. Um, to some degree, it resembles um, an Alaskan fishing village, which I can relate to because I lived in Southeast Alaska for six years. Uh, it's got a yard for people, you know, for the, for a local group to operate. Um, it's got a small town and through this scene, just about every train in the 2% area runs through here. Um, so it's a very busy scene. Um, it gives you a good taste of the type of scenery that Bruce built. Um, in this case, it only goes up a couple feet, um, which is pretty tame by his standards. Um, but it, again, it's a neat scene. The next scene around the corner, uh, a little further down is an area we call Granny's Pit. From the picture on the left, you can see a house on a spur of rock in the middle of this pit. The story is that uh, Granny is the matron of the, of the railroad and in, is used to getting her way. In this case, the uh, company that owned the quarry where her home was located wanted to 
uh, buy her home so they could finish digging and getting all the gravel they wanted. She said, no, refused to sell. So they basically dug around her house, put a bridge in um, so that she could go back and forth from her house to, to, the, uh, to the rest of the world. Um, in retaliation, she built an outhouse out over the quarry, um, just trying to exert her, her, her control over the situation. Um, we have a roundhouse in this scene uh, with a turntable that people can operate. It you know, simply goes, you know, spins around in a slow circle. Um, this is an area that was kind of dark until we turned on the lights again and, and again added more buildings and um, made the scenery pop. And we're still trying, there's a lot of work we can do. Um, there's always a lot of work that we can do, but a lot has been done to restore the railroad. Um, just as a bit of information on Northlands, for those of you who don't, who don't know, it was started back in 1992 by a gentleman by the name of Bruce Williams Zaganino. Um, he was a local modeler um, in the area of Flemington, New Jersey. Um, also um, an organist, very talented, and a computer software developer. Um, he designed a number of computer games and we have samples of all of them. Um, there at Northlands. Uh, he built a railroad in the basement of his home. Um, when his, uh, you know, after his, his new home was built there in the area, um, built a railroad, you know, enjoyed the process, tore it down, built another one, decided to keep this one, but wasn't done building a railroad. So he decided to um, build another basement and so he could keep building. And then he built a second, you know, a third basement, and I believe a fourth basement, which all of which he filled with this model railroad. Um, he would open his home, you know, once a year to guests to come in and see it. And these tours were very popular. He would, raise, you know, do it as a fundraiser for local charities. Um, and then finally, his wife said, no more. So he purchased the property on which Northland is based back in uh, 1990. Um, I think the building was already there, uh, spent two years doing bench work, and then 1992 started working on the railroad. And for the next uh, four to five years, he worked there seven days a week, 17 to 18 hours a day, building this huge creation um, by himself, pretty much. He had help with the bench work, you know, and the supports and the framework um, that everything is built on. But as far as the, the uh, scenery itself and the railroad, that's all the work of Bruce Williams. So, um, and then in 1996, he opened it to the public and then, you know, promptly spent the next 20 years, 22 years um, being open to the public. Um, about three years ago, um, he finally um, sold the museum um, to a multinational corporation called WBMN International. Um, it's a Pakistani company, actually, with their U.S. operations based in Flemington that imports Himalayan sea salt. And they were looking for more warehouse space, um, bought the building site on the scene, got the keys, came inside, found this huge model railroad display, and fortunately decided to keep it. So in the last three years, they've spent a fair amount of money to rehabilitate the railroad, um, to have the scenery cleaned up, you know, clean up the dust, um, get the trains running again. Um, at the end of Bruce's tenure, I think only eight trains were running. Last time I counted, we were up to 80. So um, a lot of work has been done in the last three years to, to restore the railroad and improvement. And we're, and we're still going. We still got a lot we want to do. So anyway, Granny's Pit is the end of the first 2% section. Um, at this point, you walk through uh, what we call the American Music Hall. Um, Bruce installed a 2000 pipe organ um, that he would play for his guests when they came through. Since he's no longer there, the organ is still there, but we have no one who can play it. So it's just there as a display. Um, but on the other side of the American Music Hall is this area we called Harper's Ferry. There are seven loops of track that run through this area. Um, in very long loops, so that you're, for, you know, you get to see the trains uh, go, go up and down these uh, this long canyon and along, you know, on long runs, which, which is really cool. Um, 
but this is the first part you see as you enter into the Harpers Ferry section. This is around the corner. Um, and it shows you a lot more. Again, the, the scenery here, you know, this um, the mountains go up, uh, you know, two or three feet high. Um, the nice thing is this is a good area that shows the water scene. And we like water on uh, on the railroad at Northlands because that's an area where we can walk. Um, it's set up to be firm enough so that we can step on that and walk into a scene to fix trains and rerail trains, which unfortunately we have to do on a regular basis. So. Um, but this is a scene, there's a, you know, a lot of detail to see, and this is a place where people tend to um, congregate a lot as they're walking through the scene. A little further down, this is still part of the, you know, kind of attached to Harper's Ferry, but it's an area we call Mansion Row um, because of the, the large houses that uh, Bruce stationed here. Um, with four trains going by, you know, um, in the in the near distance, uh, it's fun when they start pat when they're all passing each other, um, coming through that scene at the same time. And again, all this scenery was created and painted by Bruce. Off to one side um, is, this, is this area we call Joyce Town. Um, this was named after Bruce's first wife, um, who passed away, I think about 10, 15, about 15 years ago now. Um, this area actually has the most detail of any section of the museum. This was also one of the last areas that Bruce built. So, um, most of the buildings, almost all the buildings here are from kits. Uh, further along, you start seeing a lot of the structures that he, that he scratch built. Um, again, this wasn't necessarily, necessarily based on reality. It was based on his vision. And because of that, it is an area, it's a display that is quite unique. So. Further along, um, this is an area we call Summer Home. It's got another one of Granny's houses here, which is, you know, it's supposed to be her summer home. Um, there's a parade going through town. Um, and although you don't notice it in these pictures as much, um, the canyons um, go back a ways. And the trains just wind back and forth uh, up and down the canyon trying to get out. Um, Summer Home is attached to an area called uh, Dunmore, which is how we usually refer to it, uh, named after the community adjacent to Scranton, Pennsylvania. Um, but we watch the trains go and then we kind of wonder where it's going to pop out next because the tracks really wind around a lot. Um, and we're still trying to figure out exactly where they go. Um, we just hope that the trains will pop out where we can do something with them if we have to. This is further along. Um, in the area called Dunmore. Um, the ridges are populated with lots of houses. We, ne we never know how people get up and down there, um, but the houses are there, so there are people living there. This area is actually located directly above the section um, of Mansion Row. Um, and the tour you take just kind of winds around back and forth and loops around uh, to gain height. Um, at this point, we're close to the to, uh, to the ceiling. This is one of the upper levels uh, in Northlands. And then around the corner, the other direction from Denmore is an area we call Northland City. Um, this is uh, a huge city scene, again, built entirely by Bruce. Um, at first glance, this is, you know, these buildings are, are amazing. They don't have a whole lot of detail, um, but just they see the sheer variety of structures. Um, it makes it quite unique. Um, we've added a number of Miller Engineering signs um, to provide some more animation. And we've got ideas of things we can do here. Um, 
we've got ideas for we, things we can do everywhere. It's just a matter of having the time and the materials available to do it. The next area across from Northland City is what we call Bee Canyon. Um, and this is a canyon that is about 30 feet deep and I think about 60 feet long. Um, and there are, let me think, one, two, three, four, five tracks that run down the length of the canyon and back and, and loop around. So if you're, you know, if, sometimes you have to watch for a train to appear, but there will be one. Um, we have one that runs at the very base of the canyon all the way down um, on a shorter loop. Uh, but this is one, again, where you can see the trains and watch them for quite a ways. Um, and again, fortunately, we can walk up, the, up, walk along the water and get to reach trains if we have to. When trains derail a little further up the hillside, then it becomes a problem. Um, I'm big enough that I don't crawl up the mountainside. Um, but I've got a couple of young people who are much more willing and, and, and smaller and able to do that for me. So. Running along the outside of uh, B Canyon is this little town we call it Georgetown. Um, we've added a couple of animated features here in the last few weeks. Um, but we have two trains that pop through here and run through. Uh, Then around the corner again, as you follow the tour, we come upon this little area called Isleyville. Um, the trains here just go back and forth. Um, they're not connected to, directly connected to the rest of the railroad. Um, but there's some fun detail here with a lot of hikers um, in a small town um, with some neat detail in here. And then around another corner is what we call Atlas Canyon. Um, this is my favorite part of the railroad. Um, it is certainly one of the most impressive scenes that we have. Um, again, the mountains go from the floor level all the way up about 30 feet, almost to the ceiling. Um, and we have, I think, six or seven trains that run through this scene or across um, back and forth. Um, this section was named after the Atlas Model Railroad Company, um, Atlas donated eight miles of flex track um, to this project back in the uh, in the mid '90s or the early '90s, I should say, um, and got the canyon named after you know uh, after the company for their for their donation. Um, for years, if you noticed afterwards and looked at their catalogs, they did their um, the pictures from the front cover or in, in some of the pictures inside their catalogs were taken in this scene. Um, you know, as you know, I think Bruce was more than happy for the for the publicity um, and certainly, uh, you know, certainly appreciate the fact that uh, they donated all that trackage to this project. So. <coughs> The bridge that you see on the right um, cuts across from the, the top reaches of the mountain there at Atlas Canyon and then across the walkway um, into a loop um, uh, on the other side of the um, on the other side of the canyon. And we do have a train that runs across that every you know every minute every you know two or three minutes. And then more scenes from Atlas Canyon. Like I say, there's a lot of stuff to see here. And in this place, there's actually three levels um, that you can see um, the scene from. So. This is a little scene tucked into actually an opening um, as you're walking along from the base level of Atlas Canyon towards the top. Um, it's just called Carnival, uh, a lot of rides. Um, in some cases, they've worn out just from the, you know, the, the fact that they would be in run day in and day out for 25 years. Um, 
and in, in our case, we just haven't quite had enough of the motors on hand to get these going again. Um, it's on the list of things to do. No. But you push a button and you can hear the carnival music, which, which the kids appreciate. This is a new scene um, that we put in here in the last six months. Uh, we just call it salt mine. Um, those big chunks there um, that are lit up are actually chunks of sea salt um, from Pakistan. And this, again, this is, um, as I put it, this is what helps pay our bills at Northlands. Um, the company is you know, promoting the product that they, that they sell. Um, and so you know, I certainly don't complain. Um, but it, it helps us create a, a, a different scene. We've got a G-scale train that runs through on this loop. Um, and I think in the long run, we'll do some more detail in this area. But it's just with the colors and stuff, um, it's a neat scene. This is a little town we call Suckyburg. It's named after uh, one of my employees, the one who um, started putting stuff in here. Um, and it's on the, it's just across from Atlas Canyon, about the mid-level. Um, and he put in a little um, kind of a subway scene. He wanted to do that. So um, I don't have it here in these pictures. But uh, for his efforts, he got the town named after him. I decided I had to name all these towns so that we could give me, give me a reference when I'm working on stuff. So. And up around the top, this is kind of a combination of the very upper reaches of Bee Canyon and uh, around the corner from Atlas Canyon. We call this Hobo Cemetery. Um, the joke being that this is where all the hobos are buried after they die from sheer fright traveling across these high bridges. Um, but we have two, two very long bridges with a couple trains going across them. Um, work very hard to keep those trains running because if they stop in the middle of the bridge, they are a pain to get running again. But this, from this scene, you're looking down about 25 feet um, down into the, re the lower reaches of the canyon. So, but again, we've got two trains that run around there on a regular basis. Further on down, this is this area we call golf course. Um, Bruce is a huge golf fan. Um, last I heard, he's living in Virginia playing golf. Maybe not today. Um, but he's a huge fan of golf. The uh, golf club, uh, the clubhouse is based on one in Scotland, I believe. Um, but he's got his own golf course here on the lap. Um, further down, um, after you leave the golf course area, you walk across um, the front of the building on the top level, and then you come to an area we call Sea Canyon. Um, the signature feature is the Red Bridge, which you see. In this case, it's about halfway down the scene. Um, it's got three tracks that run across it, um, two different loops. Um, in this case, when I started, there was only one train running through the upper areas of this scene and nothing else did. And we managed to get one loop running across this bridge. Um, we would use, there's a second loop that kind of dog bones back and forth across the bridge, but um, the clearances in the scenery are too tight and the trains can't get through. And because of how high that is off the ground, we can't get up there to fix the scenery. So at this point, it is not a priority to get in there and get more trains running, but we've, uh, we've been able to get, you know, get more trains running, which we appreciate. Um, there's at least one loop of track on the upper level that was never finished. Um, you can kind of see it there um, in the main picture uh, where the blue, blue, uh, blue wall is. Um, there would be a bridge across the top of that, but Bruce never got that done. And so we just leave it. We, we staged a wreck on one bridge that's there as that's part of that unfinished loop. Um, so on the other side, of the scene across the way from Sea uh, Canyon is one that we call Fear of the Fourth. Um, the bridge you see is based on the actual Fear of the Fourth bridge in Scotland. Um, and there are trains that run across it. Unfortunately, they only go back and forth. Um, but there, you know, trains do run across that on a regular basis. We've got three more loops at the bottom of the scene and one uh, near closer to the top of the scene um, that loops around and we keep those going on a regular basis. 
further down on the tour is this um, area is called Western Town in St. Gallen. There's actually three different scenes here. Um, the scene on the upper right that you see in the picture here is the one that's Western Town. It's actually based on an amusement park. I think that's located somewhere there in New Jersey. I have yet to go and um, we're going to kind of do some, make a few adjustments here, make this seem more, more interactive, more interesting. Um, and then part of the, just kind of adjacent to the scene is one we call St. Gallen. It's based on a little Swiss village. Um, the trains don't run through this part of the scene. Um, they run behind it, but it's, uh, it shows a lot of detail again that Bruce put in. And then further along to the right, in this case showing the picture on the left is um, kind of an, a European pasture scene is what I would call it. And it's fun watching the trains swoop around and loop around um, as they go through. There's also a three track, <coughs> excuse me, um, a three track trestle um, built on a helix that loops around um, right next to the Western town. Um, and so you see, you see the trains loop around, pop into a tunnel and come back on the next level. And um, again, it's, it's just, uh, the activity people like watching. This is an area a little further down. Um, it's called King Solomon's Mine, um, designed as a tongue-in-cheek uh, tourist trap for people to come visit, um, for at least very angel scale people to come visit. Um, there's a castle there, um, and again with train, the train going behind it and trains looping underneath it. And it shows a lot of, again, you get a good close-up look at the, the um, the detail that Bruce carved into the rock work he did. Across from the across from here um, is what's called the town of Northlands. It's built on stilts um, clinging to a rock wall. Um, the houses were built by our ever-present granny, um, complete with their own outhouse. Um, so they, you know, they have functional bathrooms um, and running water, although I think maybe you'd have to go run and get it. Uh, but this is another uh, deeper scene with again a number of trains running through here. The the buildings that you see here on the picture on the left, um, that's some of uh, Roots's scratch built handiwork. This is the copper pit. Um, it actually has an operating uh, engine that goes um, goes back and forth up and down that hill. Um, we've tried to run a train with it, but it, it tends not to stay uh, railed very well. So we just run the engine at this point. Um, but you can look down into this pit from a couple different scenes um, or a couple different areas um, and watch the train as it loops around. But that pit is, if you're standing in the bottom, it's a good six, seven feet deep. So. Jeanville is a little town um, that the trains that pass through the last scene go through. Um, this is named after Bruce's second wife. Um, but again, just a neat town, a lot of fun detail here. Um, and then the picture you saw at the beginning of the presentation was also taken from Jeanville. And then in the last, um, the last hall, as you're walking through on your way back down to the gift shop, um, we have two different scenes um, on either side um, where the trains are running through. This one is um, a recreation of the great train chase, um, the historical event from the Civil War. Uh, in this case, they were, so it looks like they're successful in stopping the engine. So there's also a Civil War battle um, being enacted in this scene too. Yep, there it is. Next one down is the Golden Spike. Um, I know at least one of those engines is not an accurate engine for the actual Golden Spike scene, but I think that's what Bruce had, so that's what they put there. And then the other side is the farm scene that another of my employees has been working on. Um, he's put a ton of detail into this and it looks really, really, really nice. Um, but this scene is about 
40 or 50 feet long. And I think at least 20 or 30 of that is this farm scene that he's been working on. And then a little further down is the town of Ansonville um, with a steel mill. Um, the little engine that's in the front of the mill is one that people can operate, a uh, pair of push buttons, let it go back and forth. Uh, and that's it. That's what I have in my presentation. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions if you have them. I'm sure I'll be spitting out details and information as we go here. Well, I just thought that all looked wonderful. Um, I think I mentioned to you, I was at, at Northland some while back and it all seemed very sad in, in need of a lot of light bulbs and vacuum. It looks like all that and more has happened. Good job. Well, I can say I take very little credit for it. Um, the guys who work for me are the ones who do most of the work. Um, I just kind of run around and, and fix things as I need to. Um, it's what I found out, and this is from talking to people who have been there um, in the last five years before Bruce sold Northlands, but I think he was burning out. He'd been there for 25 years. Um, and the, running this place by himself, you know, even with his wife helping him, um, it's still, it's a lot of work for one person. I couldn't do it by myself. Um, I would go nuts. So I think that's what happened. He just, he just burned out. Wasn't able How big to of a staff do you have? I have, um, at the moment, two people. Um, and that's when we're all healthy. Um, at the moment, I'm actually homesick right now, but I'm getting well so I can go back to work in a couple of days. Um, one of my guys is sick with COVID again. Um, so uh, another one is a, is a college student who is on break. I think he's... I, he's here this weekend, and I'm glad he is because I it would be an, it'd be nuts. I have another person who's kind of our scenery expert, um, and so he's patching holes in the scenery which we tend to create. Um, we try not to, but stuff happens. Um, in some cases, it's just this you know scenery hasn't been fixed in 20 years. So, <sighs> but we, you know, I've got three people who work for me. I've got another person who works on the front counter on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, I'd love to have more, um, but during the week, the only person who's there is me. And unfortunately, I'm just not able to spend time um, fixing stuff because um, I've got so much stuff that I have to do behind the scenes. We have a party room, which is located where the offices used to be, um, which we rent out on a regular basis. Uh, in fact, we've got a party coming in tomorrow, theoretically. Um, and then upstairs where Bruce's apartment used to be, um, we've converted most of that space into another meeting room, which can be used for meetings or parties. Um, and we're just getting that cleaned up so that it'll be, be ready for use here pretty soon. Patrick, this is Bill Leiters. How long does it take to walk around and see the layout, assuming you're going to spend some time in each one of the scenes that you saw <laughs> today? Um, I tell people it's usually an hour to an hour and a half. That's normal for the guests who come through. Um, but I've had, there are times that, you know, I'll see people come through and it's been closer to three hours. They're just so enjoying all the detail that's there. And honestly, you know, I've seen the work of modelers in Model Roboter and, you know, and in other magazines and in videos and stuff with this intense detail. The problem with Northlands, it's so big, it's really hard to get that kind of detail, although we're getting there. Um, but they're just amazed at what we have. Um, but again, when you're looking at mountains that are up 20 feet or, you know, 20, 30 feet, um, and you can look up from the, you know, from the bottom or look down from the top and see all this stuff. And it's just amazing. Um, but there is a lot of detail and we're just, we're trying to add more, uh, trying to add more animation. So there's a button you push. So something happens, either music plays or sound, you know, some kind of sound message or something moves. Um, and we're trying to add more and more of that. Um, the problem is my person who does that usually is my college student and he's going to be taken off on me pretty quick and um, I won't see him until uh, June probably. Are you able to bring in a lot of young model, young guys that can be young model railroaders? Um, I have two young model railroaders. Um, actually, they're both um, more Lionel fans than, than uh, HO scale. Um, 
fact, all three of the guys who work for me are more into uh, Lionel trains than HO. Uh, I'm the HO expert at the museum because I've been in, I've been in modeling in HO for nearly 50 years now. Um, but um, unfortunately, there just aren't a whole lot more. Um, you know, it, we it's. Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny because we have people who have come, who come every year, they say they check the museum out. And then others who have lived in the Flemington area for a long time and either never heard about it or have never come until recently. And they're just like, wow, we never knew this was here. Um, but as far as young modelers, um, you know, we're, there's some things we're doing to try to drum up interest. Um, we've got a couple uh, Boy Scout troops coming in in the next month or so. A uh, month or two months uh, for an overnight stay. Um, I think they're going to be working on their model railroading badge, and we can. Uh, there's some things we can do to help with that, and and probably uh, push some interest. So, thank you. Uh, uh, the pictures are they all available light or? Uh... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, in some cases, yeah, the, the, the lighting is one of those things that irritates us um, because it's changed over the years. And um, th in some cases, you know, we need to have it updated, but I don't, I'm, I don't want to let anybody in there unless they realize how fragile the scenery is. Uh, most of the scenery is just plaster, a thin layer of plaster over newspaper or tape or whatever, whatever Bruce used as his you know, substratus. Um, so it's not terribly strong and we figured out in a hurry, it's not going to support you if you lean on it. Um, I know there's, I find that if there's a ridge, I can put my, I can usually support myself or hold, you know, hold my balance by grabbing the top of the ridge. Um, but you put your, your hand on the side, of the, on the side, um, any side wall, you'll probably put your hand through the scenery. Um, and we try to avoid that because it just means we have to patch a hole again, another hole. Um, but um, yeah, most of it's just, you know, the, the light that's there, we're um, kind of switching over to LEDs as much as possible. Um, but I think it's been the, light, the lighting systems have been changed, you know, from time to time. And in some cases it's 30 feet off the ground um, <clears throat> and you're standing where there's not necessarily a whole lot of support. So we just, um, it, 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 working here is a challenge um, is probably the best way to put it. How did you wind up working there? Nice. Um, I actually remember hearing about Northlands way back um, in 96 when that article appeared in Model Railroad Magazine. And so I heard about it, never went because I grew up in Oregon. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a long ways to come out here. Um, plus, Flemington's kind of, out, it's out of the way, um, which is nice. It's a neat place to live. Um, but, um, I think I saw, I, I had friended the museum on Facebook and then I saw a notice that they were looking for someone to be the caretaker. And I was at a job here in Maryland that I was not happy at, um, contacted them, talked to, talked to the person who was running, who's managing it and he hired me. So the nice thing is I was able to get space in Bruce's former apartment. So I live up there um, for free because uh, that was the only way he was going to get me. Um, my wife works here um, in DC uh, as a federal employee. So, and she's within three years of retirement. So she's not moving if she doesn't have to, <laughs> until, <laughs> unless something really good comes up, you know, which is always possible. And I warned my boss that if my wife gets a job somewhere else, I'm leaving too. <laughs> so, but in this case I'm gone, you know, during the week and I'll come, come home every couple of weeks to see my family. So they rem remember what I look like. How many feet of track is there? Um, each of the loops is independent, which is very fortunate. Um, I'm pretty sure it's eight miles, eight actual miles of track, because that's how much we got from Atlas. So the <laughs> Atlas donation is basically all of the track work on the layout. Pretty much, pretty much. So. And then when you have a, a train that becomes disabled on one of the tallest bridges, how do you deal with that? Um, we have some claws um, that we use. And in fact, one of them stretches out to about eight feet long, I think, six to eight feet long. So if we can get it, fit it inside the bridge, we can get to the train and we just pull it out. 
you know, bit by bit until we get it off there. And then there are places where we can reach the loops, you know, <laughs> safely. Mm. But usually, uh, you know, if, if it's on a bridge like that, I'm thinking of the ones over Hobo Canyon, by Hobo Cemetery. Um, I have reached, had gone in there with, a, with, with that long claw and, and, and slowly pulled the, the oh, train oh, no. part of time. In some cases, the guys oh. have to crawl up the scenery. Um, and you don't see it in this picture, but um, especially in Atlas Canyon, there are little terraces. And, you know, I was told when I first started, if it's if a, if a place is flat, it's usually safe to step on. So that's why all the rivers are safe, because they're flat and they're built to support us. Um, up Atlas Canyon, there are terraces that you can step, you know, from one to another. Sometimes there's a building there that you have to move, so you have a safe place to step. Um, but that's how they get up the canyon. And in some cases, you can get to the scene from inside the scenery. Mm -hmm. So... There are little trap doors that we can open up. And we don't use those very often. We usually just, you know, reach in from another area um, or from underneath. Um, there are 100 tunnels, um, I think. I've got the stats in another document here. Um, but if, 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 the, if the train's coming out of a tunnel, there's a place underneath the scenery that we can usually get to it if we have to. Um, and the scenery is very sturdy. The, the framework under there is very sturdy. Is there a central control room? <laughs> there is. Um, everything is still powered by a whole bunch of MRC Tech 2 2400 throttles. Um, <laughs> and each throttle controls one loop of track. So we just, in the morning, we come in, you know, hit the breaker, and then we turn them up one at a time very slowly. Um, the 2400 is the throttle featuring pulse power, which we don't use. Um, I would much have preferred that he used the 2500, which has the momentum switch uh, or the momentum feature so that we could start it up and then the train would slowly accelerate to the speed we want. But, um, but that's how everything's powered. Um, when COVID hit last year, year, year and a half ago, um, the museum was shut down and uh, Northlands had, a, you know, the people who were available were there working. You know, you know, on eight hour days and doing scenery work and some of the best scenery with best work that um, that I've seen was done during that time, um, including in the control room. They did a bunch of stuff with lights where you come in, you see lights flashing and, you know, things. It looks like, you know, everything's being controlled by those lights. It's like and people are so shocked. When I say, no, nah, that's just for effect. You know, at least models do the work. We are looking at ways to change the control system. Um, and, you know, following what Entertainment Junction is doing and what Wunderland is doing. Um, so we can, you know, you know, push one button and then all the trains start up slowly with momentum so they accelerate slowly and don't derail when they take off. Um, mm. we're, we're looking at that. In fact, uh, one of my guys and I are planning a trip down to Choo Choo Barn in Strasbourg uh, to see how they do it. Um, and then I've also been informed by somebody else, there's a guy uh, I think up in New Hampshire, who has a Southern Pacific Railroad that's got a neat control system that's similar. Um, that I, you know, I would love to take a look at that someday and, and see how that can be applied to Northlands. Um, in our case, I want to go to more instead of one big control room that everything's con controlled from, to go to um, several, like five or six smaller controls. Um, so that I can replace the wire with something heavier. Um, I suspect Bruce used 18 gauge wire to wire the entire railroad, which, you know, back in the 90s, that was probably state of the art. Nowadays with DCC, um, we've learned that that's not enough, especially for the long runs. Because I'm sure we've got a huge voltage drop to some of these scenes and it drives me nuts. With the layout this size, how soon do you know that there's a derailment? Um, we try to do a walk around, um, you know, once an hour or so, and we'll, you know, we'll catch it pretty quick. Or when a customer tells us, and usually they're very quick to say, hey, you know, we saw derailment in this, you know, up here. And it's like, oh, what scene was it? Um, 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 well, it's where this thing was. And we're like, oh, boy. Um, we don't have any kind of tour guide yet. Um, that's something I'm working on. Um, there's no point in having a map because it, 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 the way this goes, the the tour just winds and wraps and down and up and down. Um, so you just kind of keep following it. The, um, the, the order of the presentation here is pretty much how you see each scene um, as you're uh, going through the museum. 
Um, but usually it's just we find out when somebody tells us or if we walk around, do that every hour or so. But it's, you know, even if we're just walking through the museum, um, it, it's a 10 minute walk. You know, if, we, if we're walking through without stopping, it's a 10 minute walk. If you have to stop and rerail the train, it takes a lot longer. Well, I'll keep going. So has, has Bruce been there since, uh, since uh, he sold the place? No, everything I hear, I, I fortunately, one of my volunteers um, who was helping for quite a while used to work with Bruce. He was one of the last people hired by Bruce. Um, he's a volunteer now. Um, he's actually another person who's back in school, um, in college, but he came in and did a whole lot of work on all of our engines. And I have a nice big collection of engines that are ready to put on the railroad when, when one dies, which happens all too frequently. Um, but he, he's talked to Bruce recently and Bruce still has no desire to come back. When he burned out, he totally burned out. Um, which is a shame. I'd love to pick his brain about why he did stuff. Um, just to understand his pro his thought process so that we can try to, try to keep it that way as much as possible. Yeah, I, I went to Northlands, I think it was either 1999 or 2000. And your pictures are great, but they, they really don't show the scope of this place. The scope and scale is, it's just overwhelming when you see it. And to think that just one guy was doing that, it's just mind boggling. Yeah, yeah. And Bruce, from, what, I, from uh, what Chase has told me, Bruce didn't want help when he built this. He wanted, he, I think, you know, he had this vision of what he wanted. Um, yeah, that's what he told us. Yeah, and, you know, and, 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 and you know, in, in, in many ways, it makes it more impressive what he accomplished. You know, it was the work of one person yeah. in a very short time span. So, with quite the sense of humor. <laughs> oh yeah, I think that it tends to be endemic in this hobby. <laughs> so, like I say, um, we're up to about eighty trains running. Um, we could probably add you know, a few more loops and get and get those running. In some cases, they haven't been. Um, they, they've never been functional, but, um, you know, we're trying to get more and more trains running. We're trying to add more interactivity with, with people. Um, in some cases, they put in buttons um, to push for something to happen, and then nothing, nothing was connected on the other end. Um, and I think those have all been resolved. We've got some kind of, you know, something going to happen now when you push a button. Um, we're starting to fall in love with the... Um, buildings and accessories from Menards um, because um, there's, is, you know, the, you, the, that has the interactivity. Um, it has the animation that we're looking for. Uh, the problem, of course, is there isn't a Menards anywhere near us. So we either have to order it or, or you know, or figure out how to, you know, get it to us some other way. So. My understanding is that the realtor told the new owner that you can just clear out the building. <laughs> and, um, thank, I mean, and thank God the new owner ignored that. Yes, yes. Um, I think they saw that. Yeah, it, 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 um, they certainly appreciated. They told me how much money they put into it. Now, I don't know how much of that money would include the money they spent on marketing, um, which is kind of the area of expertise of the guy who's who, who's running the U.S. operations right now. Um which is great, but I'm kind of going, marketing is good, but if we don't have trains running, it's not going to, you know, in the long run, it doesn't matter a whole lot. Like, we need money for this and this and this. One thing I want to do is add trees. You can actually see trees in this scene that I've shown here, um, but in so many places, it's like it. And my problem is coming from the Northwest, I'm used to seeing conifers everywhere. Um, so that's something that I want to do. Um, you start adding a lot more conifer trees and deciduous trees, just in, but something that's more than an inch off the off the scenery. Um, the thing is, with this museum, I could spend the next twenty years building trees, and it's just going to suck them up and want more. <laughs> but that's one of the projects that I, you know, that, that we're going to try to work on. Mm -hmm. 